birthday. Howdy to y'all. Gentlemen, we gotta take our hats off. Is that when, when we take our hats off now, or is it this prayer time? We'll do it in prayer time. You can have it on for now. Let's all stand. It's good to see everybody today. Whether you participated or not, it's still good to see you. Amen. But I appreciate everybody that tried to make an effort, and we're having a great day. I'm looking forward to it. I'm enjoying myself already. And we're going to turn to 554. 554. I'll fly away. 554. 554. Let's see all the verses. Four. Some that morning. So good to have you here. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Dear Lord, our heavenly gracious Father, Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, Lord. And Lord, the, the older I get, and I know many of us, Lord, are at a point in our lives, Lord, where we're, we are ready to fly away, Lord. We're ready to come to be with you in heaven, Lord. And Lord, as you tarry, help us to be faithful in witnessing and help us to, to lead others to Christ, Lord. Help us to be obedient to you. And Lord, now as we go about these, uh, this revival meeting, and especially this morning, Lord, that we just rebuke Satan in this place. We just pray, pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would have freedom to move about, that our hearts are prepared to receive that which you would have for us. And Lord, we just pray for revival in this place and in our hearts. Bless us now as we go about our service this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. 515, if you would, please. 515. Since Jesus came into my heart, first song, last verse, number 515. Since Jesus came into my heart, 515. 515. 
If you will, grab your Bible, turn to Matthew 23. We're going to be reading verses 23 through 39. 23 through 39. Okay, this is not a sword here. Verses 23 through 39. God's word says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye may clean the outside of the cup of the uh, end of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto the whitest sepulchre, which indeed appear beautiful out outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of, of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we, have, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, <clears throat> excuse me, wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye servants, ye generations of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from, the, from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest, stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chick, chickens under her wing. And ye shall, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth. So ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, if sometimes we find ourselves on the wrong side of the Lord, and I pray that it corrects us. Lord, that we know that when your word says X, and we are we're thinking of doing Y, Lord, that we're wrong, and we need to repent. Lord, I pray that this revival meeting uh, will, will touch our hearts, Lord. I pray that you prepare our hearts uh, for the word that you have for us, Lord, and we'll be able to apply it to our lives. I pray the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You can be seated once again. Let's take our song books. We'll turn to 543, if you would, please. 543. When the roll is called up, it's going to be first and the last verse. Number 543. The sound of the land shall be no more, and the morning rips eternal right there. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is falling yonder on me there. Sing it out now. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. Sing 
standing. Let's go to 553, if you would, for our last song. Let's all stand. 553. There's a lamb that is fairer than day, the sweet by and by. 553, we'll do the first and the last verse. Number 553. There's a land that is fairer than and by faith we can see it afar. Oh, the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. We shall meet.
ministry over 50 years and been in evangelism for several of those years. Worked at a camp, was a camp director for many, many years, something like probably 35 or so years. 40 years as a camp director uh, down in Kentucky and lots of uh, great decisions made for the Lord there. My wife used to talk about how uh, Brother Smith was the, the kind of director he would come and pray over each, each bunk many, many of the weeks, many, many of the years. Um, just pray over that bunk and say, Lord, somebody important is going to be in this bunk right here. And uh, he was a terrific camp director for many, many years. So let's go ahead and have him come at this time. It's time for preaching now. And uh, he's going to preach this morning. And of course, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, once we do announcements at the end of the service, I'll talk a little bit more about a slightly different schedule for today. You'll understand it real well. But this time, let's have preaching. All right? All right. Thank you, Pastor. Take your Bible and turn to John, or yes, John chapter 12, excuse me. John chapter 12, it's an honor for my wife and I to be here with you. If you would like to and have some extra time, Mrs. Smith and I will not charge a very high amount, but we've known your pastor's wife since she was a teenager, and we have a multitude of stories that enlighten your life. And a very, very, she's not even here, is she? She wasn't even a woman. She's smart, she'll take off if she knows it's coming. (laughs) We, uh, We love her very, very much, and thank the Lord for the opportunity to be with you. My wife and I, as he said, have been married actually 53 years, and I finished up a term with the Army and, and different things, and we, had, uh, during that earlier part of our marriage, were involved in churches, and so we are just honored to be able to be here. Being married 53 years, we've never had one fight, not one fight at all in 53 years, and you're looking at me, some of you are smiling, some of you are thinking, yeah, right, buddy, huh? Sure. Now listen, please, we've not had one fight. Now we have the world's record on a multitude of times of intense fellowship. And so we're two firstborns married together. And so we like to call it intense fellowship. Do you know what firstborns are? They're heady and high-minded. They're stubborn. It's their way or the highway, all those things. And I've learned to say two of the greatest words to be able to make it those 53 years. We actually knew each other for around 55 years. But the greatest words that I ever learned were these words. Yes, dear. It just helps a lot, fellas. It really does. So I thank the Lord for our, my relationship with my wife. She's my encourager. She's my strengthener. She's my leader. We do have two children. Our son is 48 years of age. He is like an assistant pastor in our home church in the state of Iowa. Our daughter is a pastor's wife. They started a church in Louisville, Kentucky, um, down over there. But we're honored to be able to be with you. Thank you for allowing us the privilege to be here. Thank you for allowing us to use a lot of your parking lot out there. That's our home as we travel around. And of course, I've been blessed because I've seen a couple of Ram pickups, Rams in the Bible. I saw yes, four that I laid my hands on that and I'm praying for that four and several other. Now I'm just teasing. It's okay to smile, you know. It's all right to smile. I've owned Ford, but I got over it. My father was all Chevy and GMC, but I saw Ram all through the scriptures and I decided to settle in on there. If somebody say amen about that. Would you say that? Who drives a ram? Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, the rest of you I don't like. No, I'm just teasing, okay? Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You don't know me. I'm trying to learn you. Sean and I tried to say hi to you and shake hands. We're from the country. I'm a redneck from Missouri. We don't know strangers. When my wife and I were courting, and I've always I courted her in a pickup, where she's been in more pickups than you can ever imagine. And you know, when you drive down the road, you got your hand on the string on. You don't have to do a finger like that. You nod your head or you wave your hand like that. She said, do you know those folks? I said, no, I don't have any idea who they are. Well, why are you waving them all? I said, it's called being friendly. It's being friendly. And her being an Iowa girl and me being from Missouri, it's a little bit different. Are y'all okay out there? I know you're about as far as eight me or what. I'm a hunter. I'm a fisherman, and I enjoy that. But uh, I like to look at people's eyeballs because the eyeballs let you see the heart. I brought a poem that my mother in law said, Dave, the very first time you go to a church, you must read this poem. It will help the people to understand why you are the way you are. Now that statement, why you are the way you are, I wrote a series of books, and when the ladies went ahead on our church staff and uh, proofed the books and edited the books, they both said to me this, Brother Smith, we enjoyed everything. It's tremendous. We hope you'll write some more. But when we edited it, we left you in it, but we corrected the words. I'm not sure what that is, but I do say, I'll teach you a word. I don't know how you say it here in this part of Ohio, but I was raised to say wash. Do you all say wash? Okay, good. The thing that sits in the living room, some of you call it a couch. How many call it a couch, would you? 
Okay, sorry for that. How many of you call it a sofa? Okay, just a couple. The true name is Devan. How many of you know to call the divan? Anybody like that? See, you're going to learn things this week that God doesn't even know. And uh, here's the way the poem goes. It's entitled Three Rooms in a Bath. In Nashville, every family boasts of five rooms in a bath. But in my youth, I never had but three rooms and a bath. They built the outhouse on the bank of Tumbling Creek. And each time I passed, I had an urge to push the outhouse in. For weeks, I fought this powerful urge. But one day I was weak. I slipped out to the outhouse and I pushed it in the creek. That night, my dad called me aside, and all he had to say was, do you know who pushed the house into the creek today? I told my dad that it was I, he didn't even chide, but then and there, with a leather belt, prepared to tend my hide. But daddy, when George Washington cut down the cherry tree, he told the truth, and his paw let little George go free. But let me ask you something, son, my dad said with a frown. Was his paw in that cherry tree when George <laughs> shut her down? So that was explains my wife there. And Brother Dave, did you, I go by Brother Dave and uh, Brother Smith, and uh, did you really raise with an outhouse? Yes, you just learn how to push them over with the door down and wave through the holes as you go by. All right, there you go. So you need to know something about my wife. She is a grandmother. We have six grandchildren. Our youngest is 14, and our oldest is 24. We have six fellas, and, or five fellas, and one gal. And I'm looking for a husband for her right now. I plan on shooting several of the fellas this afternoon, but we're just doing the process of elimination. I figure if I lock and load and say, run guys, we'll see who runs the fastest in the direction. There you go, some of you are smiling. But this is a story possibly could be about my wife. An elderly Florida a lady in Florida did her shopping. Upon returning to her car, found four males in the act of leaving with her vehicle. She dropped her shopping bag, drew her handgun, proceeded to scream at the top of her voice, I have a gun, I know how to use it, get out of my car. The four men didn't wait for a second invitation. They got out and ran like men. The lady, somewhat shaken, then proceeding to load her shopping bags into the back of the car, got into the driver's seat. She was so shaken that she could not get her key into the ignition. She tried and tried, and then it dawned on her why. A few minutes later, she found her own car parked four or five spaces farther down. She loaded her bags in the car, drove to the police station, where the sergeant to whom she told the story couldn't stop laughing. He pointed to the other end of the counter, where four May Hagel men were reporting a carjacking by a mad elderly woman, described as white, less than five foot tall, glasses, curly white hair, and carrying a handgun. And I don't know, but this is the little history of my wife. They're all right. Take your Bible and go to John chapter 20. I, I'm getting on quite of a ring up here. I don't know what it is. I have one on my left hand, but there's two in my ears now. And John chapter 12. I am honored to be able to be here. I've had the privilege to meet your pastor on different occasions. And uh, it, it's, I'm trying to figure out why Rose married it. No, I didn't say that. But uh, uh, we're, we're enjoying it. I love church. church. I am a bus kid. And uh, my parent, grandparents took me back and went to church. Dad moved us from the state of Iowa in 1963, moved to a community that my father did not go to church uh, with us. My mom did, and my mom rode the bus with my brother and sister. I have a sister that's four years younger than I am, a brother that's almost seven years younger than I am. I do not know, I do not understand, but I'm so thankful that day that the Lord Jesus saved my soul. I haven't got over it yet, don't plan on getting over it, but I'm even more overwhelmed and even more humbled the day that the Lord laid upon my heart and he called me to preach. As a bus kid sitting in a youth rally in the back row on the back side, when I heard a me message preached from the maniac of Hedera, I couldn't sit on my seat any longer. I came and I knelt and I said, Lord, you can have it. I said, it's not much, but you can have all of it. So for these years, we had a joy and a privilege. The only regret that I have at this place at 72 years of age and almost 73 in my life, I wish I had another life to give to the Lord. It's a Western Sunday today. We're going to have a roundup today is what we're going to have. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I love cowboy. My grandfather was a cowboy raised in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. His parents died, or his dad left his mom, and his mama died giving birth to his sister. What ended up happening, an aunt found my granddad and a newborn baby laying beside their, his, his mother. His aunt picked those children up. Took them to Creek Creek, Colorado. At 12 years of age, my granddad started driving mule teams 
hauling uh, gold ore out of the mountains there in the gold mines. He loved cowboying and he began to rodeo. And rodeoed all across Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming, headed back towards the Midwest at the Missouri State Fair. He got busted up, and like most cowboys, they're all broke anyhow. When he got out of the hospital, he had to find a job. He got a job on a farm that during the Depression time, when everything had just shut down. And what ended up happening, my granny was helping the cook for the hired hands, and my granddad and my granny met for the first time. My father was born crippled, he's handicapped. Yeah, I had the privilege of giving, taking his funeral. He went to heaven almost 30 years ago. I often wonder if my parents could see what God is doing now. I love God. I love his word. I want to serve him. You're about to hear a message, but please don't say it's a good message or a bad message. I'm just a sinner. But God gave me the privilege to be able to live for him, the privilege to serve him. I want to live the best I can. During these next three days we're together, you'll probably hear some things and they'll say, how in the world did you do that? I often say, Father, I hunger to be so close to you that nothing can get between me and you. I'm not asking you to have my convictions. I'm not asking you to have my standards. But I just like to be me. And I said, be a Lord. And after Sunday school, I went out and laid on my face and that trailer and said, oh God, may your spirit come this morning. Oh God, I yield myself to you today. God, I hunger for your anointing and I hunger for your filling. If you'll stand together with me, we'll just, if you can. If you cannot, please don't stand up. I'd like to read some scriptures today. I want you to see that if you would, please. Before I get to preaching, I want to tell you something that Elizabeth Taylor told her last husband. Don't worry, I won't keep you very long. And you'll be the first to know when I'm done today, all right? Everybody okay? All right. John chapter 12, look at verse number 32. And if I... And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Amen. Then he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Watch these next two verses. Then Jesus said unto him, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come again you upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus, and departed, and hid him, did hide himself from them. I often wonder as I read this passage of scripture, why did he hide himself? His desire is to draw people unto him. His desire is to see that all people would be saved. His desire is to see those people that he has blood has washed their sins far away to live for him to serve him. I want to look at the scriptures today about two roundups. Then I want to talk about, in a very short time, the third roundup. There is coming a roundup. That's the title of the message today. Father in heaven, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the opportunity to be at the Decatur Baptist Church here in Ohio. I pray, Father in heaven, that you'd bind the devil and the demons of hell, that you'd put a hedge of protection around us. Father, these folks I do not know. I've just got to meet for the first time. I've attempted, Father, to shake most of their hands. I do want to get to them. I don't look at them as just people. I look at them, Father, as your creation. I look at them because you love them. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to Calvary for them. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the opportunity for us to grow together. I pray, Father, as a dying man and looking at dying people, that, oh, God, you'd come and fill this place. Oh, God, you'd come and anoint this place. Oh, God, I yield myself to you, and I pray right now that you'll fill me, that you'll anoint me. Oh, Holy Spirit of God. Please meet with us, Father, in a special and powerful way. If there's one here, Father, but however many there are that have never trusted you as their Savior, I pray that they be born again today. Amen. I pray that they would realize that you love them and you sent your Son to die for them. Then, Father in heaven, I pray that you'd kindle a fire and set folks on fire. Because, Father, we hunger for revival. Our country needs revival. Our churches need revival. But, Father, it all begins with us as individuals. Bless now this service, I pray, in a special way, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, and thank you for being patient. As our brother read in the passage of Scripture in Matthew, you don't need to turn there, in 23, I rejoiced as I said, Father, please let me see that you're part of the service. 
And in verse number 27 of Matthew 23, the Bible says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together. Oh, I love it when I, he was reading those words and I saw them. How often I would have gathered my children together. But listen to this. Even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. I've raised longhorn cows for over 30 years. Black Angus before that. And then being with the camp ministry and being in the country. And there was a time we had over 400 dairy cows. The stupidest thing I ever did in my life. We had a dairy that was close to the camp where we were at. We needed the finances. They milked 2,600 cows a day. Now, I milked Jersey cows when I was a boy. I can't imagine grabbing the faucet to 2,600. It was, a, it was a milk factory, and we signed a contract to be able to help my son and my son-in-law. My son-in-law is raised from the city. My son is from the country, but we raised heifer calves. So when a, a calf would be born, we'd run to the dairy, and we'd pick it up and bring it back and begin to bottle feed it. And for a while there, for a couple of years, we did over 400 bottle calves that we'd run on average, and they grew up about 700 pounds. We'd drain them, and they'd go back to the dairy. But I love also chickens. I like fried chicken. Amen. I like boiled chicken. I like chicken any way you want to do it. You want to do chicken stew and everything. But I love watching when you're trying to get all the hens in and the roosters in in a storm. And there's some baby chicks out there. And you see over in the corner, you see a mama hen, mm -hmm. and she's pretty well settled down, and she's spread out. And she kind of has her wings brought forward. And you look underneath there, and you see those baby chicks. I often think, as Jesus gave us that illustration, is that the way he feels, and it's much greater than the way he feels, than I can even imagine in my mind, how he says to us today, in this whole world that we look at that's going crazy, he said, I want you to pay attention to the mother hen and how she puts her arms because I'll never forsake you and I'll never leave you and I'm still in charge and I know what's going on in this world and it's all going to happen because when I return, this world's going to think they've got everything together. But there's going to be some folks left behind and those folks left behind are going to go to a place, my friend, that where the worm dieth not, the thirst is not quenched, there's gnashing of teeth and they're screaming and there will never, never be any peace and joy. Jesus sent his son and he said, I, I love this world. And he sent his son, his only son, to die on a cross of Calvary. His blood was complete. His blood was perfect. His blood was precious. And as the scriptures say, there's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Oh, if you don't know him today, I beg you to trust him. I beg you to allow him to have your heart. I beg you to allow him to have your life. Then, my friend, this whole world offers nothing. It's not been successful about anything. And my friend, I gave seven years of my life to the United States military. And I, if I had to, I'd do it again. But my friend, there's nothing better than an old saint of God that loves God, that knows God, that desires to live for God, that desires to please God. There's a lot of roundups in the Bible. But the first roundup that I want to talk to you about. And you say, Brother Dave, what is a roundup? To drive or collect a number of people or animals together for a particular purpose. Cowboys from different ranches came together each spring and fall to round up the cattle. They separated the cattle to belong to the various ranches, branded the new calves, and drove the steers off to the market. For several weeks during that roundup, they slept and ate along the trail. Please don't worry about it. We're not taking anybody to the market today. The focus is on bringing people to the Lord Jesus. Amen. The focus is a great roundup. The greatest roundup that the roundup will ever be. But I want you to take a look with me today if you look at the first roundup. The first roundup brings us a focus on people. God loved this world and he wanted a relationship with this world. And when he created Adam and Eve in day number one, prior to Adam and Eve being created, in Genesis 1-1 the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. In Genesis 1-2 the Bible tells us, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters, God's spirit and God's presence was here. This, my friend, this old earth that you and I live on was at one time completely covered with water as we know the Bible is and God's spirit walked there. But on day number one of creation, God created the light from the day and there was also darkness by night according to Genesis chapter one, verse five. God did that and God didn't make a mistake and God was happy with it. On day two, God created the, separated the waters on the earth and made the heavens, and God called the dry land and earth, and the water sea. Listen to these words. And God said it was good. On day three, God created grass. 
herb yielding seed, fruit tree yielding fruit. God saw that it was good. On day four, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. Two great lights. You ever just look at the moon and realize that one day God spoke and it was there. We can't look into the sun. I love reading about eagles. I love reading about the bald eagle. They have very few people know that the eagle is a wonderful picture for marriages. It's a wonderful picture for rearing children. It's a wonderful picture for a relationship with God. Number one, for marriage, eagles only mate for life. Lifetime. Lifetime. Eagles, number two, not only have the greatest ability to be able to be the fastest bird on a dive, and the eyesight is unbelievable. But they have lenses in their eyes that the United States of America have decided to copy to put into every astronaut that goes into outer space. A lens that will be able to look into the sun. An eagle can fly and soar directly into the sun. Oh, that we would take that pattern and that we would use that. God said when he created those beautiful lights, he said a greater light to rule the day, a lesser light to rule the night. And then God said, and God saw it was good. Man. On day number five, there were moving creatures. There were fowl. There were great whales. There were every living creature that moved. And God saw all that, and he said, it was good. <coughs> but listen, please. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, day number 6, And God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness, God blessed man. God said to man, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. And in Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it's the only place that he says this. It was very good. Man was happy. God was happy. They had a relationship. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it and was set apart for the service of God because it had, he had rested from all his work which God created. Things are great. God is blessed. Man and God have unity. Then Satan tempts Eve and Adam. Eve sins by eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 12, listen to these words if you've never heard them before. Wherefore, as by one man, one man that had a relationship with God, one man that had peace with God, one man that had a blessing with God. Sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all men have sinned. Now I want you to shift with me in your mind. If you can get it in the scriptures, you're welcome to turn. God has a roundup. The very first roundup. But before we go to that roundup, I want you to understand something of looking into commentaries and different things. As I looked in commentaries and I studied in the different passages of scripture, where we're about to look was the year on the creation of this globe that you and I live in, approximately 2,020 years. It's immaterial, the exactness of it, but the 2,000 is vitally important. As I read on, I want you to listen to this, please. The devil did not tempt Adam and Eve to steal, to lie, to kill, to commit adultery, to be tempted to do anything independent of God, but to break the relationship with God. To break the relationship with God. That is where man is today. We want to go ahead and look at one sin or another sin or another sin. Maybe justify ourselves and maybe say I understand that. But what God is looking in all of us, he's looking for a relationship. And the 53 wonderful years, and they've been wonderful years, and they've been great years. And the sadness that I have living in the 70s right now is I'm living in a point in time in my life that I realize my relationship earthly with my wife could soon be gone. We could go to sleep in that trailer tonight. I could get up in the early morning hours, as I always do, a little before my wife. I could go down and begin my time with God, read my Bible, my prayer time, study my Bible. And I wouldn't hear her resting. I wouldn't hear her breathing. I wouldn't see the trailer moving just a little bit. And I'd become concerned, and I'd go up. I know that day might come for me, and I know that day might come for her. So how can I do less than give him my best? Because he's the one that allows me to breathe. He's the one that allows me to see. He's the one that allows me to walk. He's the one that allows me to exist. And I thought about Adam and Eve. They heard the voice of God. 
I don't know that they could touch God or not. That's immaterial. But they had a sweet and wonderful relationship. But now that relationship is broken. But God lets man continue on. But in Genesis chapter 7, verse 16, there was a rejection of God by man, except Noah and his family. And God decided, I'm going to have the first round up, and it became around the year 2020 approximately. I cannot imagine the screams that Noah could have heard. I cannot imagine the as the rain came and the floods came and the water got deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, verse number 1, God remembered Noah. The time was approximately the time after the creation of the earth at 2020 and approximately. If we look at it, it could even be as high as 2,461 or 2,457. It's immaterial. It's around approximately 2,000 years was the first round of All men are dead. They're gone. Except Noah and his family. Life and time ticks on. God tried to bring men together in a roundup. Noah preached 120 years, built something that he'd never seen, built something he didn't know how. But he listened to God as he had that relationship with God, and he did it exactly the way God said. And God blessed Noah because of his life of listening to God, serving God, and living for God, his wife and his children. Listen, please. There's another roundup that's coming. All men are now dead and gone except Noah and his family, and life takes on. But according to Luke chapter 2, a child is born. The prophecy of a king, the savior of the world, the Messiah. In Luke chapter 2, verses 11, 10 and 11. For unto you this day in the city of David is a savior, which is Christ the Lord. The second roundup is now beginning. For approximately 32 years, he lives and ministers. He came to seek and to save that which was lost, according to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For less than three years, he ministered. But he lived the monks and he walked. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to draw all men unto him for that second roundup. He drew up to Calvary. He drew, us, he drew us to Calvary. He drew us to the ultimate love. He paid the price with his blood. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 22, or 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. I, my wife and I, and please, just let me be me. Let me be transparent. But in 1972, we decided the TV was consuming. The TV was consuming too much time. The TV was consuming things in my mind that I didn't want, and we got rid of our television set. I said, what in the world do you all do? We talk, we communicate, we play games. If you have one, I'm not being critical of you. I'm not being, I don't want to talk like the world. I don't want to know all the world's ways, but I have a telephone, and on that telephone I have news apps. And I didn't even tell my wife until she heard in Sunday school, because we have a dear pastor, friend, that I just recently preached for in London, Kentucky. And the first thing that I thought, oh my goodness, because where the shooter was going is just above on a hilltop where their little church is. And I thought, oh God, please let me say it. I didn't even tell my wife until she heard in Sunday school. And I imagine she's been thinking in her mind, are they okay, are they okay? And I saw a note that they were just fine and letting others know. It's crazy, though. That man had no idea who was in those automobiles. Had no idea. Why did that happen? The school shooting that just recently went on. Oh, yes, the world says get rid of the guns. It never has been the guns. It's been a wicked heart. It's been a wicked mind. It's right. been drugs. It's been liquor. It's been all kinds of things. But the world is so distorted that common sense is no longer common. Reality is no longer reality. But yet, can I tell you this? There was a first round up that came, and God said, I'm going to have a man yes. Noah that preach that I'm going to take away all life of the world, and the world except Noah and his family rejected it. And there was a second round up. And the Son of God came, God Himself upon the servant. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor, Amen. and be laden, and I shall give you rest. He said, It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But yet they rejected Him. They lied about Him. They beat Him. They smote Him. Matter of fact, they did it all for you and for me. A lady one time said in an office, I heard the word said, Preacher, I have not sinned. Yes, ma'am, you have. Preacher, I've never sinned. Yes, ma'am, you have. Matter of fact, ma'am, you went ahead and killed somebody. She got so mad, she says, Preacher, I've never killed anybody. Yes, ma'am, you have. 
She said, well, if I have, who am I have? I said, ma'am, it's your sins and my sin. Yeah, exactly. They put my Lord on the cross. My Lord was beaten. My Lord that was shamed. My Lord that was tortured. My Lord that's hung there in shame. And that when that sword pierced his side, all oh, the precious water flowed out that had guarded his heart. But then that blood flowed, my friend. Yes, ma'am. You've sinned. And all the world has sinned. Whether we want to admit it or not, it's our sins. Even before I was ever thought about or ever born, that put my Savior on the cross. Amen. But he drew us to Calvary to let us see. Amen. He drew us to the ultimate love that he gave. He paid the price with his blood. He drew us to his tomb. I thought when I just preached the other day, he thought, why did they ask the question, where is he? They went to the tomb. They knew his body was there. But why did they ask the angel, where is he? They knew he was going to be risen. They knew he wouldn't be fine there. It's just like you and me. We know what is right. We think what is right. But we've thought, forgiven, we, we, we've forgotten what has been written in the book of James chapter 1. A man that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. The revival will come. We've got to face the fact that we're still sinners. Oh, thank God that our name is written down if you know the Lord in the Lamb's book of life. And thank God that nothing can pluck you or I out of the head. But my friend, if there's not been a personal time as my wife and I was driving across the interstate, we parked the truck to use the facilities there. I got out and I looked at a man who was coming in a vehicle and parked beside us. And I realized at a point in my life, I don't know when I'm going to see a set person the second time. And there's an urgency in my heart, an urgency in my soul to look at that individual because it was not a mistake that that man from Alabama and here we're in the state of Ohio pulls off in a rest stop. And we said, howdy. And we talked for a little while. I looked at him. I said, sir, can I ask you a question? I said, sir, I don't know if I'll ever see you again in this world. But I said, sir, I can't leave without asking you this question. If you were to die today, sir, are you 100% sure if you die, you go to heaven? The man said yes, and we rejoiced, and we talked for a while. But my friend, there's a roundup coming. Jesus tried Amen. to round us up. Do you remember when I told you that God had a relationship and a walk and a time and a fellowship with Adam and Eve and it was sweet and it was precious and sin came in and after about all oh, series of plus 2,000 years what ended up happening? God said, I've had it up. I'm going to round them up and I'm going to destroy them. And that ark was built. No one's family. My wife got saved on the night that preacher, her preacher preached. Where are you going to be when the door was closed? And all the springs that are outside. My friend, can I ask you where you're going to be when the door of life closes? Are you sure if you died today, you go to heaven? Are you 100% sure I led a Spanish man and his son to the Lord that come to my Sunday school class? We thought his wife was saved. And as I looked at this Spanish man and I looked at his 11 year old son, I said, We need to know personally that you have. I shared with them the place. I shared with them the time. I shared with them the day. I don't want to serve a God and say, well, I think so. I serve an oh so God. And I, what a privilege it was when I prayed in Ricky and I prayed their little son and I heard them pray and they said, dear Lord Jesus. But I kept saying over and over, has there been a time? Has there been a time? Has there been a time? And the wife was sitting next to Mrs. Smith and she's sitting on the couch. And she says, as Brother Dave was talking about a specific time, I can't remember, you know, how precious it was to hear Tammy and Enrique and their son say these words. Dear Lord Jesus, we realize according to the Bible we're sinners. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and come into our heart. What a joy it was to see him come to church and walk through the waters of baptism and now living for God down in Lexington, Kentucky. Oh, my friend, there's coming around us. Amen. Roundup is first when the door was closed. That's right. And all men died on the face of the earth. The second roundup was a little more precious when Jesus came. And my friend, can I tell you what the year is? If we go before Jesus came, it was a little over 2,000 years. If we go to Noah and the ark, a little 2,000 years. My friend, can I tell you this? We're past the third of 2,000 years. I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. But as I began to study of the Holy Spirit pricked my heart and said, we know that it can come any day, any hour, at any time. 
But my friend, can I tell you this? It's approximately time to come. Matter of fact, it is time for him to come. First of all, Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. He is coming for a third round up, my friend, and that's promised for us to come. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, he is coming as a thief in the night. No man knows that day, but every 2,000 years approximately, and a little more, and maybe a little less, I don't know. But the dead in Christ will rise first, and it will be too late for you to come. Are you ready for the third round up? My friend, creation began in your zero. Approximately 2,000 plus years later, the flood came. Another 2,000 years plus, and Jesus came. There's a third round up coming. Are you ready? Do you know him? Are you ready to face him? Don't be left behind. There will be that great round up that day in heaven according to Revelation chapter 10, verse 15. But my friend, can I take you to verse 12? When I see that the devil himself is going to be kicked on out and only those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, my friend, I hope he doesn't say to you, I never knew you. Don't lose the joy of that special day. My friend, we are all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. My friend, the Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, the Bible says, but God commended his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. It's simple. It's easy. We pulled into Interstate 80, westbound. My wife and I use the facilities, got back in the truck, to head on down the road. My wife said, honey, look at that older man. And the older man was pushing the carts and the trash cans. I pulled the truck closer to him and I got out and shut the truck off. I pulled the track out of my gospel, out of a gospel track out. And I said, sir, my name is Dave Smith. I said, my wife and I travel, I'm a preacher. And I said, sir, I saw you work here. I said, sir, I'm in my 70s now. And it blesses my heart that a man, I'm, you're older than I am, age is still working. I looked at his eyes, and the tears began to flow as he said these words. Well, we had a farm, three generations. I gave the farm to my son, the fourth generation. He said he got married. I thought things were going well. We signed everything over for our son. We were going to live in the old house, and they were going to build a new house, and they built a new house. And then he began to cry almost uncontrolled. And he said, but my son's wife decided to divorce him. And they lost, we lost everything. And the house that I was living in, that I was born in, that I was raised in, was gone. I said, sir, can I tell you about a new house? I had the privilege to go down to the plan of salvation. When I pulled away, that old man said these words. This has been the greatest day of my life. Wow. There's a roundup coming. Are you ready for the round? There's a roundup coming. Are you going to be left behind? All the cowboys all gather together. The talk is going to be there. And one day we'll all gather in heaven. And I want to be with my king. I want to be with my Lord. I want to be with my Savior. But I'd like to be. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know 100% sure? It doesn't matter the age. It doesn't matter what you put in the offering plate. It doesn't matter who you know and where you've been. My friend, throughout the years of preaching, my wife and I have seen three preachers' wives come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. I thought I saved Brother Dave. I thought I knew Brother Dave. But in my heart, there's an emptiness, Brother Dave. In my heart, I'm not sure. Oh, how precious it was for those preachers' wives to just swallow their pride. Say, no, I don't really know. My friend, do you know? Do you know? There's a roundup coming. It's coming soon. Don't be left behind. There's a roundup coming soon. The first roundup was there when the door was closed. There was screaming. There was hollering. There was begging. I can only imagine what it was like when the floods began to drown and the homes were destroyed and the lives were ruined and the families were separated. But Noah! having a relationship with God. And then when Jesus came into this world and walks amongst as a carpenter's son, 
I can't imagine him living and walking to the temple as a 12-year-old boy, according to the book of Luke, when he was teaching and reading the word of God, what his father wrote, and interpreting, and they were amazed. I can't imagine how wonderful it was when he began his earthly ministry, and those who could not hear began to hear. Those who could not see, that woman that had that possibly cancer, that just said, I want to touch his, him and his garment. And he said to his disciples, who touched me? And the disciples said, the Lord, you're in a crowd. No, virtue is just like, you see, when the soul gets saved, when a soul gets saved, there's rejoicing in heaven with all of them. I cannot imagine what it was like when Peter, or Stephen, excuse me, was stoned to death. But I picture this for me. According to the scriptures, it is the only place that Jesus stood and welcomed Stephen. God's not asking you to be martyred. God's not asking me to be martyred. God's not asking us to give anything except selfish pride and admittance that we have no hope of heaven and no hope of eternity. If you're not trusted in today, I beg you to trust him in just a few moments. If you know him, if you know him, then I beg you to get a fresh love for him. I beg you to get a fresh surrender to him. I plead with you, just go ahead and say, God, I want that freshness of you. This is a revival meeting. This is a stirring of the saints. This is a revivaling of what our relationship with God you're here today not because any other reason than you want to please him. That's why you came to church. So let's go down and please him. And let's yield our lives to serve. Every head bowed and every eye closed. There's a roundup of coming. There's a roundup of coming. Are you ready for the roundup? You heard about the other two, but now there's a third one coming. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, you say, Brother Smith. I'm here today and I have no doubt and no question because I can remember when I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. If you know him, if you know him, would you slip your hand up and say as a testimony to him, I know that day that I asked him to come into my heart. Thank you. God bless you for being honest. If you're here today and you're not sure, you're not sure if you died today and go to heaven. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around, would you say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I thought I was. I'm just questioning a little bit. That's all right. Man alive, I'd just go ahead and get it taken care of. Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you please pray for me? I sure will if you slip your hand up. Is there a man, is there a woman like that? Thank you, God bless you. You're here today, you're saved, you're born again. There's a roundup coming. Are you ready, Christian, to meet Jesus? Are you ready to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Has God stirred your heart? Let's have a revival. Let's let God have our heart. For the day that you were preaching, God spoke to my heart. Would you pray for me? I sure will if you raise your hand. Is there one? Is there one? God spoke to me while you were preaching. God bless you. I see some hands. Father in heaven, please give the pastor wisdom in this invitation now. I pray, oh God. Father, I did what you told me to do. Oh God, honor your word. Father, please draw us to you in a special way. With heads bowed and eyes closed and everyone standing as the song began. I need to use the song for you to come right ahead as she plays. We're going to sing two verses of 366. Come ahead as she plays.
wagon. All righty. We are going to be having a meal. Um, we've kind of gone over most of this, but uh, just, just so everybody's understanding the different type of schedule we're going to do today. There's no evening service today. I'll mention here in just a moment. Um, but right after this service, in just a few moments, we'll be over in the fellowship hall. There'll be uh, a meal provided for you over there. And this is considered dinner on the grounds. Does that mean we take our food outside with us today? No? Okay. Dinner on, on the property is what that means. Okay. Somebody said dinner on the ground. I prefer mine on a plate. But uh, yeah, please do put your food on a plate. That's the plan. But uh, it's on the property, right? But uh, anyways, uh, then this evening, let's see here. Where is it written? This evening, this afternoon, we're having a meal. Okay, soon after the meal, not immediately, but fellowship, have a good time with your fellow, fellow friends. And we're gonna then have the afternoon service, and that rather than meeting is gonna be an outdoor service, okay? So I'll have some of the men help us out, moving some chairs outdoors right there next to the fellowship hall. We'll be outside for an afternoon service. And then, about uh, five o'clock tonight, we're gonna have a uh, bonfire. For those that are interested, we, I know we got some of our family something, they'll be there, and there'll be hot dogs, there'll be s'mores. Uh, come, sit around the fire a little bit, and have some fellowship there, if that is something you'd like to be involved in. So, that's today, five o'clock, and there's no evening service gonna be here at six o'clock. We're having the afternoon service, the outdoor service. Again, by the bidding. All right, then uh, tomorrow, the ladies are going to have a fellowship at noon. It is a potluck, and Smith is going to be giving a short devotion there. It's a terrific time for the ladies to have some fellowship and uh, enjoy some time with her, somebody who's been in the ministry for many, many years, and, and uh, fellowship with them. And then um, we want to encourage you, of course, to come out um, Monday night and Tuesday night for 6 o'clock. Uh, the services are going to be a delightful time for you. It's going to be an encouragement to you. Uh, your spiritual walk and your spiritual life is your most important part of your life. You increase your ability to, you know, uh, your devotions and so forth. And this, that's what this is here for. We want to increase our, our spiritual strength in our church. We want to increase our spiritual stability. We want to grow spiritually. And that's what it's here for. I encourage you to be here Monday night, Tuesday night at 6 p.m. You won't be disappointed. Then there will be Friday, uh, the game night that we normally do about even that every month. It will be this Friday. That will be the 13th at 5.30 p.m. And so that's a follow-up as well. And you know about the fellowship there that we have. We play volleyball. We have a great time together. That's fun for the whole church, whole church family and all ages invited to that. Of course, we got visitation on Saturday at 10 a.m. We're still collecting candy for the Barlow Parade. If you want to be involved in that, just bring some candy out and get your wrapped candy. And if you wouldn't have that here by the 22nd, as the latest, that would be very appreciated and helpful. As uh, Brother Perry mentioned, please do keep Miss Susan in your prayers. And uh, goes in tomorrow. Just pray for her. The Lord bless her and take care of the needs there. All right, the men's prayer breakfast as you can see in your bulletin at 8.30 a.m. on October 5th and October 8th. Ladies will have a fellowship at 6 p.m. as well. All right, I think that's what I've got. So like I mentioned, come out, enjoy some fellowship, enjoy some food out there uh, for lunch, and uh, you won't be disappointed with the food as well. I'm sure of that. Let's all stand, shall we? Brother Perry's going to pray and ask the Lord to bless. Here, is your table set up over in the fellowship hall? No? Not yet. Okay, I'll, I'll it's up to you. It's up to you. Sure. Sounds great. Brother Perry, why don't you pray? Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy to us, Lord. We thank you for your word and your presence in this place this morning, Lord. And as the, the message that we heard this morning, Lord, I just pray that each and every one that is here, Lord, has got that uh, settled in their heart, Lord, of knowing you as their personal Savior, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that you'd be with our afternoon uh, meal and service, Lord. I just pray that... Uh, Lord, that 